uh, former partner Monica Ponce uh, de Leon. Um, let me start with the more, let's say, biographical notes and uh, hopefully towards the end of this uh, short presentation of Nader, I'll, I'll share with you a few anecdotes and, and things that I think describe very well uh, our, um, uh, you know, today's uh, uh, lecture. So basically Nader currently is uh, also, in addition of his very successful practice, he's uh, the Dean at the Copper Union uh, in the Irwin S. Chenin uh, School of Architecture. Uh, in addition, he has been uh, for four years the chair of the um, School of Architecture at the inside the MIT, and uh, you know I think he he has proven to be one of those you know designers, practitioners, and scholars that is very prolific in almost like every field uh, within the the design uh, disciplines. Um, basically. Uh, when I was trying to put together some notes uh, on, on how to introduce Nader, um, you know, I realized that, uh, you know, probably his education reflects very well this, you know, capacity and this uh, kind of like prolific uh, uh, character that he has. Uh, he was, he studied briefly at MIT at the very beginning, then he did his um, uh, formal education at RISD and this was followed by a master at Harvard. But then he also spent some years uh, doing postgraduate programs uh, in London in the Architectural Association. So he's somebody that has, I think, grasped very well the, the, the strength in, uh, or the strengths of uh, RISD as an arts uh, or fine arts school, the kind of intellectual and historical grounding of, of Harvard, but also, you know, the technological aspects and advanced aspects of both MIT and the, and the Architectural Association. So it is no surprise that, you know, he, he has been uh, so strong in all these different, um, different fields. Um, you know, before I jump into today's topic of, of, his, uh, of his talk, uh, you know, I want to mention that the first time I met Nader, uh, I was actually at the AC. Uh, this was probably 2007, 2008 when uh, we were doing, you know, not online presentations, but, you know, um, real time physical ones. And I have the chance of just simply basically helping another with his computer setting up, uh, you know, uh, getting him ready to do the, the talk. And I remember at that time saying like, you know, I'm considering going abroad to, to study my masters. And, you know, right away, he didn't know me at all. And he offered like support and say like, Danny, of course, you know, write me if you need so. A few years later, when I had a wonderful scholarship, he, uh, you know, I, I decided to write him. I remember the first uh, response I got from him saying, like, Danny, absolutely, come see me in my office. We will talk about the programs and different options. And I remember uh, he promised two things. He promised uh, taking me to the best, uh, you know, breakfast place in the U.S. that ended up being a Dunkin' Donuts. I will never forget that. It was a, you know, <laughs> true American experience. <laughs> The other thing that they strike me a lot, and I always remember, is that it was a Monday morning with a big office of, uh, you know, 30 plus employees. Another spent no later than four hours with a very young architectural student at that time trying to make sense if he should apply to MIT, to Harvard. And he spent four full hours on a Monday morning just to help me out decide on that. So, you know, it's somebody that I think that little gesture speaks about his, uh, you know, generosity and, and, and grandiosity of really, you know, devoting time also to the, to the, to the education, to the newer generation. So I'm, I'm always in depth of, uh, of, of another for, uh, for that. Um, I want to say also, you know, uh, talking a little bit about what uh, he represents to me as, as an architect. I think somebody that I personally have looked, uh, you know, throughout many different phases of, of my career, because I think he's not only a very strong architect in the kind of like traditional, more disciplinary sense, but he's somebody that I think has been exemplary on how to really introduce um, you know, questions of uh, advanced digital design, but also digital fabrication in a very, very natural way within his, his architecture. Not surprisingly, uh, when I visit and I had the chance of visiting his office, he had, a, and I think he still has, you know, a big shop with a milling machine and, you know, all the kind of like equipment where he, in many projects, he prototypes and he's all the time, you know, incorporating these tools as a generative, uh, you know, um, kind of like a, a tool for uh, for design. So I think he's somebody, uh, you know, very important to look up because he he's definitely rooted on the kind of like a most exemplary tradition of, of architects, but also somebody that is has been um, um, very prolific in inserting all these kind of like contemporary uh, contemporary techniques. So I have many 
projects that are probably my favorites of, of what Nader has, has been doing, you know, including, you know, the Bank U restaurant from the office that, um, um, a period, the recent uh, RISD student housing building that I was teaching a couple of years ago there, and I managed to, to follow all the kind of like, uh, like process, the Rock Creek House, which is a masterpiece, especially because it's able to, uh, you know, uh, have the same design intensity from the tiny detail all the way up to the entire kind of like a holistic vision of the project, something that I think is very consistent throughout, uh, throughout his work. The last thing I would say is that, you know, I was trying to find also a way to connect it a little bit with the Barcelona kind of like culture and, and the best description I could come up is like, I think now that is uh, kind of like embracing probably um, the best attitudes and the best design methodologies of Mirages, but in a very contemporary uh, uh, way, incorporating all these kind of like advanced digital design tools and, 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 and design and digital uh, fabrication uh, techniques. So, you know, again, uh, only, uh, you know, uh, admiration and, 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 and deep appreciation for all the work that ha he has been doing. And, you know, it's a pleasure to, to have you here now. So, Besides that, I will just simply say that um, um, another is going to tell us today a little bit about um, um, his work that hopefully is going to end up potentially in a book publication in the in the upcoming months or uh, maybe years uh, on basically the role of architecture beyond the specific the specific time where it has been craft crafted. I mean, as you guys know, many of us fall into the trap of architecture following the kind of flavor of the month, what is trendy now and kind of like abandoning that very quickly. And I think now there has been a very interesting on really doing a type of practice, doing a type of architecture that really transcends in a way time and these kind of like flavors of the month. So we are very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing from him today. So Without uh, further ado, another welcome to YAC. Uh, thank you for doing this in the middle of the pandemic and in, uh, in the online uh, platform. We're super happy to, uh, to have you here and uh, please uh, join me in welcoming another Terani. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danny. Uh, if I had ever known that uh, a Dunkin' Donuts breakfast would uh, sponsor such a generous introduction, I would get the entire audience the same. Uh, let me uh, and see whether this works or not. Um, uh, yeah, we see your screen no, very well. No, I always, I always screw this up. One second, please. Yeah, okay, is this showing now? Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, beautiful. So uh, thank you, Danny. Uh, it, it's great to be amongst uh, uh, old friends and colleagues. Uh, some of you may not know, but I've been back and forth to IAC so many times uh, over the last uh, decade or two uh, between Vicente and Areti, among others. It is always a pleasure to come back uh, in, in whatever capacity. Uh, on this occasion, as Danny said, uh, I am, uh, I've used the COVID period essentially to develop one book, which will come out soon, uh, which is on a debate between myself and Scott Cohen. But the second book I'm working on is trying to compile a, a, a thematic logic out of the work at NADA and Office DA uh, over the last two decades, which has not been uh, documented. And, and instead of uh, putting a, se a sequence of projects in a row, uh, the thought was to get them into a thematic chronology rather than a building chronology. Uh, timely uh, anachronisms, uh, refers to my interest in developing a practice uh, and a posture towards discourse that not only responds to the challenges and problems of our time today, uh, the specific technologies that we uh, engage or, or the social problems, but rather having a conversation with an architect two, 300 years ago, as much as imagining conversations we may yet have with uh, architects not born for the next 50 years or 100 years. The unmatched hair uh, stands as a, as a great allegorical figure uh, in this context. Here you can see the poor hair uh, unmatched uh, with his surroundings as a result of um, climate change, what should have been a context more like this. Uh, the discussion today will sponsor uh, a few categories. The monomaterial ethic, 
the catalytic detail, and, and that has to do with some of our early work and an approach towards material um, um, agency. The second has to do with figurations and configurations and part to whole reciprocities. The third, the tectonic grain between architecture and nature. Uh, and then in the last three, a broader discussion about social engagement and how that uh, essentially establishes a parity between control and collaboration, um, whether in success or failure, uh, and then the pedagogical building uh, with the three schools of architecture, and finally political entanglements and the, the challenges that we face along the way. Uh, because of the way that I'm lecturing also, I will go relatively fast because each segment holds quite tight uh, uh, with itself, so that uh, it, we can be loose and slightly messy. These are my working notes towards the book. And so um, I'm more interested in your reactions afterwards than, than anything else. The monomaterial ethic emerges in great part from my interest in Leverance and you know, his ethic about not cutting the brick and, and what that can produce for an architecture, but also his insistence on using the brick as the ground, as the wall, as the ceiling, as the roof, uh, it is a, a, an intensive use of a medium that radicalizes its architectural possibilities, knowing fully well that floors and walls and ceilings do different functional performative things. Keep an eye on the mortar in, in the work of Leverance, because we do leverage that uh, towards different ends uh, in, in our work. Um, the catalytic detail also is very important because out of a commitment to a medium uh, emerges certain types of details that are not instances in architecture as we've come to know them, but rather they become systems. And so the rustication of Plechnik's library is important, not because it supports the building up, but it becomes the field condition out of which the entire building is read within the urban landscape. You know, the idea of figurations and configurations speak to the top-down way in which we are taught architecture, but also the bottom-up way in which we have emerged in, in the scene over the last 20 years. I mean, the, the bowl and the nest are effectively the same figure, and yet the, the tectonics of the bowl or the aggregate molecular nature of its material constitution is completely concealed. It's an abstraction really. Whereas in the nest, every blade of grass, every uh, twig has an agency of its own uh, conspiring to create a, a figure. And for those of you who understand how nests operate, you realize that this is just one nest amongst many other configurations uh, that uh, suggest an architecturality about them and the way that we can create an architecture that becomes rather than just conforms to existing typologies. Uh, part to whole reciprocities are important for me uh, because they, they speak to a longer tradition about the constitution of an architecture and how it is expressed. Uh, I like the, the little passage from The Little Prince because we are taught in architecture often to uh, read it uh, uh, in terms of its iconicity, uh, its, uh, its surface readings, uh, the hat, uh, and yet uh, we take a certain different kind of pleasure to understand the relationship between the figure uh, uh, of the hat and the elephant as it is ingested by the snake to understand that uh, the way that architecture contains certain organs suggests the kind of virtual transparency that is a central part of architectural performance, whether semiotic or otherwise. Uh, if, if you're hearing uh, uh, sirens in the background, I live in the hospital district, so this is just part of my daily life. Um, the idea of uh, uh, of uh, the kind of shrink wrapping of buildings and the legibility of buildings is poignant. Of course, most often in artists' hands like this, uh, as the, the language of classicism is concealed, but we can imagine it uh, fully encrusted in, in our memories. But uh, when we do reflect on certain classical buildings here, 
Palazzo Massimo in, uh, in Rome, uh, it becomes all the more interesting when we understand that its latent symmetries have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, configural asymmetries of its interior. And so part of that uh, complex and contradictory relationship between the inside and the outside is something that uh, we will speak to later also. The idea of the tectonic grain uh, emerges from a, a kind of uh, natural gestalt, but of course in architecture, it has all to do with a kind of artificial imposition of the architect uh, herself or himself. Here, the, the kind of geological strands that burst from the core of the earth uh, vertically are contradicted in detail as we see the horizontal strains on each piece of stone in the lateral direction. Uh, a lot of the tectonic grains to which I will speak will show how material agency uh, organizes the entire building from the ground up. Social engagement, uh, we have done many collaborations, too many to enumerate here, but suffice it to say that these are moments in our practice where we abdicate uh, control while maintaining, while attempting to maintain maximum control at the same time, knowing fully well that some people know their metier much better than ours uh, and us as orchestrators of architecture having the responsibility and the, the honor as it were to put all of the different fragments together in a narrative that is larger than the sum of their parts. The pedagogical building has to do with a passage of our own experience around 2008 when the whole world was economically going bust when we entered 14 competitions and won three of them, all three of them schools of architecture, spaces of learning. What I'm interested in the pedagogical building has not to do with only spaces of learning, but how that building with such an audience may serve as a didactic instrument. And here, as you look at the work of Artigas, you are not only impressed at the organization of the building, but how the structure seems all uh, at, at once implausible and, and yet absolute in its definition uh, of the feat that it is enduring. Uh, and uh, finally, the political entanglements to which I will speak will speak to a range of things, the means and methods about how architecture is produced, uh, the role of the public and the private, uh, the positioning of funding for infrastructure and engineering within the public realm, and essentially the way in which architects can get, the, get, get their agency known from the programming all the way through the process uh, of a construction and where we can be most effective. So uh, within the context of the monomaterial ethic, I, I take you back to Casa La Roca, a, a project that effectively uh, uh, transforms uh, Leverance's uh, fascination with the mortar, recognizing that the mortar is a variable dimension, uh, able to expand and contract what I call the variable bond to produce uh, a tectonic of foldability such that it gives lateral stability to the building from a structural perspective, but also invites the passage of light and air into the building. Here, you can see a detail of that wall where the stitched seam of the corbelled brick allows for that passage of light and air, all while imagining that parametrically, that mortar line is something that can breathe. Uh, that is translated in the Tongxian Art Project where we're able to establish a reciprocity between the programming of the building and its image uh, here, circulation, uh, the passage of smoke in the fireplaces, the, the, the location of the mechanical equipment, they all acquire a kind of legibility in the context of the base, the shaft, and the top. And the figural distortions of this building uh, respond to the, uh, the, the passage of water as it is drained over the top of the roof and becomes an essential part of, uh, of the expression of the building as its end grain becomes uh, 
ensconced in the architecture itself. Now, if you think that material legibility happens at the scale of bricks and uh, shingles and uh, precast units, once you start getting to the larger scale of cross laminated timber, uh, then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you're talking about panels that are two meters by uh, 10 meters. And such is the case uh, for our uh, house in Sharon, Connecticut, uh, now currently uh, under development, that uh, that material agency uh, demonstrates itself to be absolute uh, in its uh, uh, creation of a a uh, structural monolith out on the outside that would not work had it not been paired up with a balloon framing system on the inside to allow for you know the ducting of the mechanical systems, the wiring of the electrical, and uh, essentially all of the plumbing systems that are embedded within the hollow core of the interior uh, space. This is a very dumb and simple house that is uh, essentially materially dedicated to cross laminate, uh, laminate timber as essentially 12, the, the, in, instead of having 1,000 or 10,000 bricks, it's made up of nine panels of wood. And the logic of the building uh, surrounds one simple idea of a stair uh, that takes a simple plan and rotates it four times to create a promenade under and over which one can program the entire building. And as such, uh, effectively, uh, all of the toilets, uh, showers, closets, uh, and uh, service spaces happen in the poche space on the outside, while the rooms are these flexible units uh, on the interior, every single one of them with a picture window out and a closet and a kitchenette uh, behind them with a poche space that is either stair or inhabitable beds and or uh, chaise longue and support spaces. And so uh, this is a building now that we're essentially fabricating ourselves uh, as part of the kind of experiments that we're doing. So in many of these buildings, uh, we are not uh, designing uh, a concept first and then building them later. All of them require the catalytic detail as the precondition from which we think structurally or materially. And so uh, I'm gonna start with RISD uh, with the detail and then later on show you the urban context within which it occurs. The building to which I'm referring has a, an Eastern and Western facade of a dormitory that contain it whose logic is robbed from the adjacent roofs. All of the roofs of Providence in that district are slate roofs that we monumentalize and extract to become part of the shingling system uh, of that east and west facade. It is a very thin system and admittedly part of a curtain wall rain screen system that is uh, endemic uh, of our culture today. Uh, but that also is able to capture the quality of light uh, and um, that is uh, characteristic of, uh, of about 10 in the morning all the way till two in the afternoon. The key detail to which I'm referring happens to be the shingle detail uh, in correspondence with the awning. Is it the awning window that informs the shingling or is it the shingling that informs the awning? Uh, what is important for me is that these two conditions conspire to come together uh, in a kind of conceptual embrace where you cannot divorce them from each other uh, at all. And this is the building in its kind of uh, uh, urban context. Similarly, uh, in the context of uh, the Tenderum Bridge in, in Melbourne, a, a pedestrian bridge that connects the tennis open grounds to the Yarra River, we imagined what we, we, we posed the question, what would it mean to overcome the traditional dichotomy of structure and skin and extract it out of the logic of rebar, a structural redundancy that through its bending, both on the longitudinal and the lateral axis 
a kind of braiding of structure such that the maximum moment of the, of, of the bridge is suspended at the middle and then rests lightly on thick pylons on either side of the park. Within this context, the reflected ceiling plan, the underbelly of this bridge has its most important role as a kind of lattice work within the park. And the rebar then wraps around towards the railing, the guard, uh, as well as the, uh, the light fixtures that are on top that speak to the skyline of Melbourne uh, in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, on the top. Uh, what is important about this project is that this space of access is only really occupied for two weeks a year, just passed a little while ago. Uh, but the reality of this project lives somewhere in the horizon line in between, where the park is active uh, at all months of the year, and this uh, fifth facade, as it were, uh, is animated by a structural system uh, that gains its agency through its redundancy. Uh, similarly, uh, in the Daniels project in Toronto, the shingling system contrary to the RISD system that shingles down, shingles laterally on the north-south axis and rotates to enable uh, the passage of light and air on the lateral axis where this building uh, gains access to the city. Uh, it's an expansion to an existing neo-Gothic building and both um, the reveal where the hydrology of the building controls all of the passage of water and the main entry to the building uh, conspire and come together with a shingling system that organizes the muteness of the facade uh, on the east and west side. So we are interested in figuration for sure, but uh, operatively we work with configurative systems to come up with those figures in this sense, uh, though we are enticed by the figure, the sculptural figure of the left brick as it's carved out of the brick, in fact, our operational stance is to work with the purity of the brick and its geometric positioning to induce a certain different kind of legibility. And so we're not innocent of the kinds of uh, figurative operations we are undertaking, but they're always disciplined by a material logic that could be no other way. So for instance, when we're dealing with corrugated metal, we recognize for instance, that the line at the top and the line at the bottom need to be exactly the same linear dimension in order to produce what is called a ruled surface. A ruled surface allows direct straight lines from one end to the other, allowing for the spatial deformation that then connects the living room to the garden uh, within the logic of an in interstitial space that creates an awning between the two. This is a logic uh, that we've uh, uh, also undertaken for a range of buildings and projects that have really captivated my thinking in the last 10 years that deal with what I call the sixth elevation, and that is the reflected ceiling plan. Uh, whether it's, it, it was one of our earlier projects in the, in the pizzeria, which had uh, hundreds of mechanical systems overhead with a kind of triangulated shingle system that uh, approximated a compound surface, or whether it dealt with uh, our intervention into a building uh, next to the site of 9-11, for smooth panel surfaces that were at once acoustic, um, mechanical, and uh, adorned surfaces that uh, contain the structural systems and the service systems uh, of this space, or, or whether it had to do with uh, the bank restaurant that Danny was just referring to before, that inherited all of its structure from top down. Uh, our interventions in all of these have to do with the legibility and the performativity of that ceiling as one of the major architectural challenges of today. We need to deal uh, with the urgencies of, uh, of uh, HVAC, sprinkler systems, lighting that become part and parcel of every architectural act today. 
And in that sense, our Adams library uh, is, is not a mute and neutral wood lattice on top of the library. It is the single most uh, important element uh, of that library. Uh, so here, uh, you can see the way in which that library is premised on a monumental facade, a, a pediment and, and at one end, uh, uh, in contradistinction to the neighborhood in the back, which is made up of small houses and small roofs over each program that come together in a single surface, a fifth elevation, if you will, because all of the houses are looking onto that roof, a southern court, as well as a northern court uh, that frames an oak tree, an existing oak tree, the logic of which revolves around three areas of uh, library congregation for adults, adolescents, and kids, the structure of which goes in the lateral direction and gains a kind of important presence within your imagination of the space. It's not oh, something that's just there. It's actually a surface that is legible underneath you as you navigate underneath it and engage the public spaces on both sides of the building. And so it's important to understand that uh, this is a building whose facades are as, as, as little important, if you like, as the facade on the interior, the ceiling, and the way that they relate to the different uh, envelopment of the various programs on either side of the building. The main reading room being on the public side, and then the the, the seminar rooms, the work rooms, and the offices in the back where the individual pitches bring them together. Uh, this idea of the performative roof uh, is also absolutely central to the Villa Varroise in Southern France, a, a courtyard building in what is a, a landscape project essentially that brings two levels uh, of a residence together on, on different levels through two stairs. And those stairs offer the alibi for a figural gesture, the coming together uh, of a structural system that is shrink wrapped around the stair itself. Uh, a cantilevered front, uh, front facade that is torqued around a stair that holds it up in the air. The morphology of this building is absolutely important to understand though abstractly and ideally a square, it deforms in accordance to its views and its sight. And instead of being an internal court, it uses the topography to deflect one floor down and one floor up, creating the need for the stair to begin with. And by doing so, it animates the roof to connect to the Western side of the house while also engaging in the landscape below to come up through under the gates, as it were, into the courtyard where the private areas of the building are concealed from the neighbors. And here uh, it's construction of that landscape uh, with a kind of concealment of the very things that contain those stairs. Um, the logic uh, of the graining of, of the concrete, the housing of the stairs, and its structural systems are central to the conception uh, of this building from underneath, but so too its roof then uh, is in dialogue with a similar system of thought. Otherwise a very simple uh, case study house that you might see in California, an extruded glass box. Instead, what we do is we recognize the Western elevation, lift the roof, and by doing so, we're spanning not only the lateral, but also the longitudinal direction of the house, inviting the light and air uh, on, the, uh, on the lateral uh, axis. Here, framing the Pinus Pinei uh, up on the upper side of, of the hill and engaging a, a major portion uh, of the site that would have been uh, towards the back. And in so doing, essentially acknowledging that the ceiling is not merely a cap on architecture, it is the architecture itself. Now the tectonic grain is one of those things that uh, one might uh, uh, 
in a way, sell off to nature itself. What is the grain of the wood? What is the quality of that grain? But also we must engage in the industri industrial processes of how wood is cut in the first place. We take it a step further by understanding that tectonic systems like shingle systems or shiplap systems or board and batten systems have the capacity uh, not only to read differently, but perform differently. And so in this rural house in Massachusetts, we take the opportunity to conceal the garage doors of the base of the building, to mute them out in favor of other significant elements. Uh, and by doing so, eliminating all of the added elements and fixtures and hardware that may be put or supplanted onto it by unrolling the batten system to become the handles for the door of that building. So we recognize that somehow embedded in every building uh, or in every manufacturing process, there is a kind of latent logic. Uh, we, we don't build very much in concrete in the US, but in the one or two opportunities we've had, we've also been surprised at um, uh, the, the kind of liquid state of concrete, forcing you to think about it as the formwork that creates its, 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 its expression or the afterwork. And so while working on Villa Varrois, we were constantly imagining ways in which um, fabric formed work may produce or introduce a, a rustication uh, into that surface to give it the sense of weight and depth. And yet uncomfortable with the semiotics, uh, the semiotic bias in this, we said, well, what if we forget what it looks like? Let's imagine what its constitution is. If we think about the aggregates, they are already insinuating the depth and the weight of something that you're working with. And what if on the inside it's smooth because that's where we would hang paintings and uh, touch, it will have more tactility. But as we go outside, the ratio of the aggregates uh, and the uh, cement, uh, the mortar as it were, uh, gets inverted as it goes into the landscape and becomes just a French stone wall. And this panelization of that logic tr produces a completely different reading uh, of this house. Alas, not every detail that you conceive actually happens, but we went back to that graining of the woods uh, and realized that that was the most economical way to do it. So by sandblasting the wood, we radicalized the uh, long grain of that wood, but also exacerbate the end grains when we have them. And this concept of the end grain is something we're working on right now in the context of the Venice Biennale, where we're undertaking uh, another experiment with, uh, um, uh, cross laminated timber, uh, knowing that the different layers uh, of that wood uh, are going perpendicular to each other and usually not legible um, to, um, to the viewer's eyes. But as you begin to route into them, a herringbone pattern emerges uh, out of that logic and begins to animate the relationship between structure and skin uh, and, uh, and how uh, the piece may work structurally. I'm, I don't know if the audience can hear the music, but this is also uh, probably a nice moment to acknowledge uh, Anton Garcia Abril, not the architect, the composer who, who left us uh, yesterday and whose music, in a way, is so well known to the, to the Spanish ear. But uh, this project is, uh, of CLT is something that we continue to work on and are, are very engaged in right now. So as we come back to RISD then, uh, uh, that tectonic grain plays itself out uh, at an urban scale in a completely different way because of the persistence and the presence of brick as part of the character, not only of the hill, but of the RISD campus. And the tectonic logic of that brick uh, is something that we introduce at the base of the building, as well as on the facade in the south and the north, 
where it gains most access to the sun. And knowing that it's a curtain wall system and not apt to gain any legibility from the perspective of depth, we're operating within depths of half inch to one inch, uh, carving in and carving out to gain from the pre-panelization, pre-fabricated brick panels, a sense of depth where there is none. Here, the logic of the, the landscape spells out uh, the hypostyle hall of RISD, but in its facade gains a kind of depth in with the help of the sunlight uh, as it, it casts shadows uh, on this uh, figure of the front facade with the end grain of the east uh, and the west containing it uh, on both sides of the building. And so you already saw the shingles, but now uh, what you're seeing is the end grain of the metal blades that contain the brick and the thick and the thin come into conversation with each other uh, along their tectonic differences. That same logic is very similar to the way in which we conceptualized uh, the housing for MIT, whose skin system corresponds to the structure that cantilevers both north and south of the building uh, as a moment frame. The entire, this is not a building that has a structure under it. The entire building is the structure and the facade system oscillates uh, between its various limits, uh, changing color to produce the illusion of height as the various uh, panelizations of um, anodized metal get lighter and lighter as it gets closer to the sky. The uh, organization of the building also in, uh, ingests all of the mechanical systems into its core, thinning out the end grain of the facades such that the end grain is absolutely thin while the face grain uh, captures the light in radically different ways based on sunset, sun, uh, sunrise, and middle day and gray days. And so uh, with the north and the south, the south is absolutely porous and absorbing of, of the sun while the north is more protected with its pilasters. Uh, and, uh, and, and now that it's built, one can come to appreciate the way in which the image of the building is a direct result of its tectonic performance as the various panelizations migrate north and south in uh, syncopated ways. Here, the transparent facade of the south and here the pilastered uh, face of the north uh, detailed with the larger blades that stick out on the ends and the thinner ones that are uh, punctuated uh, in between. So the idea of the tectonic grain has a certain agency within nature, we are reminded that we as architects operate within the realm of, of artifice. I mean, zebras are not actually striped this way. They are striped in fact this way uh, with the stripes not only perpendicular to the torso but also to the legs. And this is a reminder that as architects, we specify and control these variables which are absolutely uh, artificial. So within this context then, uh, as our projects get larger and our engagement with the social and political realm much more complex, the tensions that get played out between control and collaboration become more exciting, if not more vertiginous. Uh, in some of the work that we've done, uh, for instance, on Rikers Island, this has taken a positive swift because we did not generate that project. It was a way of developing justice hubs in collaboration with anthropologists, uh, educators, sociologists, community groups, uh, people in prison, uh, uh, police officers, and a range of other people coming together and recognizing that imprisonment does not work. And there needs to be a completely different way of working together and understanding to what degree architecture does not have a role merely in incarcerating people, but it has a pedagogical function. On the other end of the spectrum, our collaborations with artists such as uh, Adam Silverman have played a completely different role because the means and methods of his own work are a central part uh, of uh, the way in which we come to recognize where our role as architects may be with him. Um, uh, Adam 
uh, is interested uh, in ceramics, uh, but he's also interested in the nature of the aggregate of earth from which his ceramics and terracotta come from. Uh, and working within certain areas of Nevada that were used for uh, artillery and missiles, he conceptualized a series of bullet systems that then we parametrically cut up into different pieces to imagine that the installation that we may do together is not one, but actually quite variable and can take on different shapes and forms as it goes to different museums. At the end, after four venues, this landed in the, na in the permanent collection uh, of the Nasher. And so this project is not our project, it is our project because of the different ways in which uh, different agencies bring them together. A similar thing happened for the Amman Design Week where our budget was so low that we realized maybe we're better off in collaborating with uh, uh, Raya, a, a famous uh, um, clothing designer, that if we brought together the techniques of weaving, we may yet build something that goes farther in the context of a novel tectonics that we would have no knowledge or access to, but that we could do something with by introducing it in the context of the warehouse in which it was slated to be installed, suspending it as a structural system from the top, uh, and then developing a way in which it would be installed for its final act. Its final act not being the installation itself, actually not quite. The unrolling of those very things to become blankets for the refugees that are taking hold uh, in different areas uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of the borderland between Syria and, uh, and uh, Jordan. Uh, so uh, these kinds of social engagements are, are part and parcel of many of our projects. And so once you start getting to the urban scale uh, 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 of a city, uh, in this case, the Spadina circle of the Daniels faculty in Toronto, uh, mediating between the historic preservation uh, of the existing Knox College, uh, developing an agenda that subsumes our new addition so that it's still, uh, 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 maintains fidelity to the historic preservation of that tower, embeds most of our program underground to respect it, and engages the disciplines of architecture, urban design, and landscape to develop the logic uh, of the building, uh, was important to recognize the importance of the north and the south facade. But even more importantly, knowing that symbolically the building works on the north and south, but actually is accessible only by east and west, meant we had to develop a strategy, a social strategy, if you will, that makes a public street out of the east-west axis that is open 24 seven and enables the public from the campus of Toronto to the Kensington neighborhoods to the west to access the street and the major public functions of the building to maintain the privacy of the studio spaces, but to make a public event out of this building. And in fact, that street is alive and well on a daily basis. It opens up to the studios above, but also the fabrication spaces that are so central to the theater of the production of this building and its engagement in the public realm as one looks into the interior street, but also works from the outside and eventually deals with um, the landscape beyond. So it's important to understand that while this is a very tight and packaged building, indeed it's a landscape building. It is using the different surfaces of the building to leak out the programs and to engage the city as much as possible. You know, with about 13 working groups, this was a complex uh, patronage process. Uh, much like that, the Adams Library disallowed us from designing anything for over a year as we engaged the elderly, the adolescents and the kids to imagine a floor plan that we would never have designed the way that we did had it not been the result of their direct imposition on the process. All the time coming together with the kind of panoptic central control of the checkout desk in the center 
we realize that this is a building that is operating very informally at the community level, but somehow symbolically, uh, uh, very civically uh, on access. And so the building actually operates uh, in both modalities as a kind of anamorphic view of it here uh, with the casual and horizontal nature in which the pitch roofs deal with the context on the axis from the north on the oblique, but in fact, uh, from the west, the perfect symmetry of its uh, pediment as you see it from uh, a another axis and the way in which this formality is instantiated, if only for a moment uh, from a certain perspective, all while working with the urbanistic features of the gardens that uh, create the, the logic of its uh, urban footprint. Uh, other ways in which we have engaged the social possibilities of these buildings is by engaging in biennales whose materials and resources would be wasted and thrown away uh, within months. We asked uh, the, the patronage whether they would uh, consider developing a scaffolding system that is not only there for the opening, but in fact becomes a central part uh, of the logic of the community uh, of, of these uh, uh, urban villages and becomes an extension to the cafe that is on the site, as well as the market space, so that it has a life long after uh, our footprint as we come to it. These kinds of social engagement are forecasted, anticipated as we come to them. In, in other instances where uh, the central core uh, of a public realm is occupied by an electric exchange, and, uh, e exchange our role is really to design the periphery of that uh, in a precast system that produces public space at the margins of an infrastructural space that would otherwise be completely uninhabitable. So these are just uh, uh, minor indications of the political entanglements uh, in which one invariably gets uh, involved in. And uh, certainly the uh, Melbourne School of Design offers certain challenges on that front. Uh, a building with no front or back, uh, it takes place uh, amongst the Neo-Georgian courts uh, of this splendid campus. Uh, so deep and wide is the building that the building itself might uh, serve as a courtyard itself for the social space that brings everybody together. In fact, that social space in, in, in the initial building was meant to serve as a, a, a congregation hall, a, a space for some exhibitions, uh, some uh, gatherings, uh, alumni events, and so forth and so on. But the reality is that uh, the building, the whole purpose of the building was to design it with uh, dedicated studio spaces on the top. And yet that was value engineered within the first uh, month of the project. So our task from a political perspective was to figure out how to smuggle in a dedicated studio space within the net to gross area of the very logic of the atrium by widening the, uh, the, the balconies, programming them with the FF&E budget, and then expanding their footprint during different times of the day when one has access to the exhibition rooms and the classrooms behind them. And so the logic of the building uh, extends from the different furnishings by eradicating the budget of the railings and using the furniture as the railings themselves. So as you go up the building, there are collaborative desks at the base, there are drafting boards uh, in the middle, and there are crit spaces at the top, the sum of which create the logic of that building as it comes together. Similarly, in the context of the Daniels building, the political uh, uh, um, challenges uh, uh, really revolved around a roof, an extension of the concrete system that spanned 120 feet with the idea that you are um, integrating a structural system with daylighting logics and the hydrological logics that gain its veracity through the uh, shell structure system, a, a kind of surface a logic that creates for an economical span. And yet the contractors told us that this was not buildable and certainly it was a million dollars 
over uh, budget. Uh, and we were left with uh, the prospect of essentially building prefabricated uh, round skylights on top of a flat ceiling. So uh, in the context of NADLAB, what Danny mentioned in the beginning, we started building a portion uh, of that in our basement. And with that, we changed the system from concrete to stick system of steel. And with the discovery of a radiant panel within which we could embed the cooling system uh, of the environmental systems of, of, of that building, we brought the budget $800,000 down with a, a kind of low resolution a stick system built with the radiant panels being installed here uh, uh, and, and then painted in and finally occupied for the various ways in which the building would eventually become uh, inhabited. So both of these as pedagogical buildings also serve the question of what constitutes a pedagogical building. Is it just a space of learning or does it teach you in a particular way that other buildings do not? And so in the context in the Georgia Tech School of Architecture, we were left with this research space uh, for an ad adaptive reuse where we realized that flexibility is the core question that brings this building together. In order to maintain that flexibility, we had to free the ground of any impediments and treat the roof as its foundation. And by doing so, all of the desks and the tables can be uh, emptied out uh, while we introduce a, a hanging studio, a hanging means of egress and the lighting above to allow for the kind of suspension of space uh, that gives rise to the logic of this building. So stealth and so limited were the budgets of this building that we could not even polish the words R-E-S-E -E in the research building in its transformation from an engineering building to the architecture building. And then, uh, of course, going back to the MSD building, the roof and the suspended studios uh, of that building resonate within a historical context as they speak to traditions past and yet do them in a completely different way, in the way that they bring into confluence the logic of massive uh, LVL beams that span over 22 meters with lateral uh, braces, uh, wooden cofferings that bring in natural light but no direct sun, from which uh, massive blocks of wood are suspended down in tension, never touching the ground below, as they come to a veneer logic towards their bottom. So in fact, uh, uh, the building is composed of a kind of inverted rustication. The rustication is at the roof uh, and the veneering systems are at its bottom as it all comes together. Uh, massive uh, lumber and timber and plywood laminates at the bottom. Uh, at the top, you literally inhabit the, the, the void uh, of those uh, structural spaces. And at the bottom, you're acoustically um, protected by these very thin veneers as they clad uh, the, the seminar space underneath it. All, all of this, of course, tapping into the, the magic of prefabrication uh, so endeared to the Melbourne context, uh, this was meant to serve as a new dedicated uh, studio space, so, uh, so heralded as a kind of successful space that now the designers don't get to use it properly because the whole campus is coming around to, to take advantage of it. So uh, but with this slide, I end and, and, and maybe open the floor to questions uh, and, and discussion. So thank you very much. Bravo, Nader, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was uh, beautiful. I think there is so much, so much in the table to, to discuss. So um, I would probably, I have a lot of things to say, but I want to give priority to our audience and our students uh, that they, they uh, might enjoy the opportunity to, to engage with you. So for all of you that you know would like to ask a question, uh, one option is to you know directly unmute yourself and ask it. If not, I'll be reading some of the questions um, that that you you guys have been adding in the in the chat. 
I see uh, here that Becky is asking a question about CLT. Becky, why don't you unmute yourself and, and address that question directly to, to another? Uh, sure. So uh, thank you for your lecture, first of all. Um, I was wondering, um, you showed a lot of examples of um, CLT and GLT and other uh, mass timber strategies. And I'm wondering how you think um, the role of mass timber uh, plays out in sort of the future of architecture. Thank you. I think the question is important, uh, not only from the perspective of mass timber, but naturally renewable resources in general. I mean, if, if you think that um, the question of the, uh, the global environment is an important one, uh, anywhere from energy use to the embodied energy of a building to uh, its material sourcing and labor, all of these become important. I think our forays into uh, CLT and mass timber are certainly not, um, we're not certainly leading that path. What we are trying to do though, is to embed some of the work being done in that area in an architectural perspective, using our discipline to leverage ways in which maybe the industry would never be interested in doing or other architects would never take the time to do. So um, uh, the animation that I showed you of the, uh, of the Venice Biennale with the end grain condition coming out is a, is a, is a kind of uh, obsession of ours that, that deals with uh, the, not only the optimization of structural systems as they cantilever, but the expression of those things as they come to the surface of that material. But I think that your question probably has to do with a more broader ethic about material usage. And, uh, and I would say it's absolutely right on target. A, a lot of the buildings that you saw me present today uh, embody another ethic, which I did not name. And that has to do with uh, the supposition that you need to finish a building. A lot of the buildings that you saw remain unfinished because we eliminate uh, certain trades that are unnecessary. So by using CLT at RISD, we're able to eliminate all of the plaster that would have been on the ceiling had we not put CLT. And so if you calculate the square footage of that, and factor in the character of the wood as part and parcel of its imagery and where that money can be placed, you, you begin to sort of understand that uh, the combination of resources, labor, finances, and the extra foot that somebody gets in the comfort of that room uh, equates to a different way of thinking about uh, design, not through its objecthood, but also through the processes in which it is conceived and eventually de delivered. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nader. Um, I see there are no other questions for now in the chat. So if anybody wants to please, uh, you know, do questions, post a, a note or raise your hand and I will give you, give you voice. Um, in the meantime, now there, um, you know, I was taking a lot of notes uh, that, you know, I would love to debrief in more detail, especially if this is going to uh, become a book publication at some point, because I think it's really, really exciting. Um, and I want to ask you about um, a tension that I could feel many of your projects have, and sometimes you lean towards one side, some others to the other. And I don't know if it's a question of a scale, so I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit. So. It seems to me that those, uh, especially those projects that are, uh, let's say, uh, smaller scale, mostly residential, you take very much this kind of like monomaterial kind of like ethic, right? I mean, where you try to mostly play with the full potential of either the brick, uh, as in, you know, in some of the house or the CLT in the Connecticut house or with the concrete uh, in, in this house in, in South uh, France. And that becomes really the kind of like the anchor It's a kind of like totality that then you apply the kind of nada magic of really, you know, starting to break it down in even smaller scales where the small details relate to the, to the totality of the project. But they are mostly to me characterized by one monomaterial approach with multiple grains of, of, of tectonics. While then the larger projects for instance, any of the um, of the school of schools of architecture, either Melbourne or or Toronto or you know Georgia, 
it seems to me that then you break down the project into sub projects and each of them then it has its own holistic approach of monomateriality but there are like maybe seven projects into one i think melbourne for instance a beautiful example right you have the japanese garden you have the balconies you have this uh, can you know like suspended atrium you have the facade that is historic i mean each of them it has its it has its consistency but then you are putting together very different tectonic system very different monomaterial systems all to work and operate um, uh, together so I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, it's, it's just a simple, maybe I'm doing like a very, you know, rough simplification, but, you know, why in some you are trying to, you know, um, use a monomateriality that prevails throughout the projects and in others, you try to break it into different components and, and give quote unquote autonomy to each of those uh, subunits so, somehow. Yeah, I, I think your question is very important because it assumes that the architect has a role of authority in determining these kinds of outcomes. As you get larger and larger and larger commissions, particularly outside of Europe in the US, uh, you never have a client. You have dozens of clients. So any of these institutional buildings that I've shown you, Georgia Tech, uh, Melbourne, or Daniels, has somewhere between eight to 13 user groups. And each of them are have political clout, uh, each of them have a voice, and each of them have the ability to create uh, sub-projects on their own volition that can never be brought together. And, and so one of the things I would say from a political perspective is to say that uh, forget our technical expertise, forget what we can do with form. The one thing that architects can do that other disciplines outside of the film industry as directors or composers of music is to integrate uh, a series of fragments that are larger than the sum of their parts, which would otherwise lead to a form of democratic chaos where everything coexists, but nothing comes together. And so um, one of the reasons I, I, I kind of went into some detail of the Adams Library is that that is an extension of a public process that uh, has the capacity to water down architecture in its ability to manifest uh, the purity of an idea or the, uh, the, the strength uh, of a singular uh, agenda. Now, uh, does it mean that the singularity of form is the only way in which these agendas can be manifest? Of course not, because uh, we look at many other histories and many other architects who operate completely differently. Uh, I don't know, from Korb all the way to Alto and from uh, Giulio Romano to, to Palladio, right? Uh, uh, you name it, there are different techniques. I think what took hold in our limited capacity earlier on was to demonstrate uh, ideological range through limited resources. And the monomedium uh, uh, ethic became a, a, a self-imposed constraint to demonstrate uh, architectural instrumentality, uh, knowing fully well that it's artificial, it's entirely self-imposed. At the same time, there is uh, uh, obviously an aesthetic uh, seduction uh, about the uh, you know the idea of purity and control which is equally artificial and so once you dabble into different authorships particularly those that uh, relish in eclecticism for instance and you know my generation, I'm, I'm here with Vicente, maybe he remembers a little bit of this, but that in our education, at the tail end of postmodernism, uh, notions of typological difference uh, 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 that, that share characteristic differences were the norm. They were the canon. And so overcoming that meant also to develop a logic, a reason, an idea about systems or an idea about materiality that demonstrated difference not through overt uh, figurations, but rather latent configurative logics that, that do the same. So part of that exercise, I would say, is purely academic, but a necessary one. But you're absolutely right the, that the 
uh, that the logic of a house uh, and and the optimization of both its uh, prices and its uh, systems are much more easier to control in a singular stroke than that of a large institutional building that has many working parts. Uh, but I, I would also uh, here talk about power. In other words, the power of, of a Nader Tehrani is just fundamentally different than the power of a Frank Gehry or a Zaha Hadid. There are also other ranks of architects who gain a kind of cultural presence where their specifications exude an undue disproportionate power to what might be right or wrong in terms of an urban response to a solution. And so here I, I, I'm sort of putting ourselves in that uh, difficult position of saying that at all the time we want power and we want control. And sometimes it is th that very power and control that stand to compromise us through the freedom of our own work. And so what, what I found is that also that uh, through a kind of democratic process, you not only become humbled by the fact that you have to deal with you know, everybody and every voice, but you also have to find that thin line that skewers uh, key priorities without which a project cannot work. And I would say that that's what you're looking at in the institutional projects. Uh, us essentially being squished between a rock and a hard place and saying, well, okay, we can't do this. So what are the key things that we can do? And what are, what are the other arguments we have to throw away? And, and this is the building. No, that's that's uh, that's beautiful, and and you know once you remind us about you know for instance Alvar Alto, and I was connecting it at the beginning with you know Miralles, maybe this is an interesting difference between those you know two architects with you that while I think you know Miralles and Alto keep playing with this multiplicity of kind of like sub projects across scales, even from the smaller kind of like houses. Maybe you share with them in the larger institutional buildings, but when 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 the scale is small and your power increases and your agency increases, it seems that you lean towards more, you know, these more holistic approach, approaches on on materiality, which I think it's uh, it's it's beautiful. And I think also that in the combination and in the tension of those two things, I mean, it's it's clear that the the, the myriad of of um, of, of repertoires uh, from a tectonic level, from a typological level, from a material level. From the different grains that you are playing, it's it's is really uh, great uh, great to see. So, I'm gonna open it up to a few of the other questions uh, in the chat. So, um, I'm seeing here. Uh, let's see the next one. So, Mo, I don't know if you want to um, unmute yourself and address your question directly to another. Sorry, yeah. Um, I was just curious about. Uh, thank you for such a brilliant um, talk. I uh, I also just wanted to ask about more so the longevity of all these materials and um, especially how we're sort of using sort of not new materials but new materials in in certain sense like shingles for example and how using metal metal for shingles. How does that? and even timber in general for buildings um, and over time, uh, just your perspective on that and how that sort of shifts um, to adapting and evolving over time with architecture and the longevity of, of buildings. Uh, That's really, the, the, yeah. In general, you will find that uh, the conventional building in the US is designed today for the longevity of 30 years to 50 years. Uh, this is completely contrary to, let's say, the Hippocratic oath that you may have imagined architecture complying with uh, in a different century or in a different mindset, where you imagine things to be permanent. I'm, I'm here recalling uh, uh, Rossi's notion of programmatic indifference and how he identifies the, the, uh, the forum in, in Lucca as, uh, as, as being a place that brings uh, hundreds of people together for uh, events, but also just a row house for people that live in today. That, that longevity of a thousand years is something that from a, let's say, environmental perspective, we may strive for. 
but it also uh, it reminds us of um, uh, the importance of maintenance, which is very uncool to discuss, uh, at least in the context of design, uh, but that if you don't maintain buildings, whether they're stone, metal, or wood, uh, they eventually come apart. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, all of the buildings that we're doing right now, uh, we are looking very carefully at with the facilities managers and their clients and trying to extract out of them an idea about flexibility, uh, longevity, and uh, life cycle costs in order that they think differently about them, even when their programs change down the line. I think the CLT um, uh, has that capacity. I don't think it, it's inherently something that falls apart. You, you uh, go to old buildings made of wood uh, and reuse their, their lumber and timber for different purposes centuries later. Uh, uh, that still holds. Metal and copper has that same capacity. Uh, our shingles happen not to be uh, metal, by the way, just so you know, they are uh, high performance concrete. They're very thin, about uh, less than an inch, uh, but, they're, but they're very strong. Uh, and they're relatively new in the market. I, you know, they, they don't show, let's say, the signs of a, a 30 to 40 year building. They, they, they have the capacity to, to be warranted for 100 years. Uh, but I do think it's, a, it, it's an important question beyond the actual specification and the cost of certain materials that we could get really sort of deep in the weeds with. I think what's important about the question is the ethic around which we build patronage today and whether we as architects are merely recipients of, of directives by clients to say that I only want this building for five years or whether we develop infrastructures that have the capacity to absorb differences of change and time and resilience uh, that we have the imagination to design for. Uh, and I think a lot of our discussions about flexibility revolve around this, this very issue. Thank you both. Um, uh, we have uh, like 10 more minutes or so. So I want to give the, the floor to Mark. Mark, if you can unmute yourself and address the question directly to Nader, that would be great. Uh, hello, good evening. And uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'll just read my question. Um, I say that m many of your projects seem to have an inherent performativity in how the materials and surfaces come together. Um, is, there, is this a product of your design process and the use of parametric tools and the tectonics of your architecture or a more intentional view of movement and time in architecture? Um, I guess, in other words, what is the role of time and performativity in, in your design? Mm. Uh, as I answer your question, I'm going to need a little bit of your help because uh, you link performati performativity with time. And I, I misunderstood it initially as thinking that uh, performance is about the uh, let's say mechanical performance, the structural performance, and the 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 kind of environmental performance of a building. So I I, I misread it initially. Um, the the question that you pose about uh, time is that about the longevity of a building, or is it about your experience of a building as it requires a temporal experiential capacity to engage them what 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 is the motivation of the question yes it's it's the experience of the building and um i was using the words performativity more like it seems that a lot of the surfaces of your building are performing some type of movement or how they come together and unfold into different surfaces etc so i was using it in that in that kind of way Yes, um, yes, that I think it's very important. I, I have to say that um, for all of my distaste about discussions about phenomenology, uh, deeply embedded in my psyche, there is a phenomenologist that 
has visited certain buildings and discovered things about them that you cannot uh, just uh, identify analytically. Uh, and so uh, there are architectures out there that have to do with, I would say a more cinematic approach to uh, qualities of space that uh, are not about the objective aggregation of, of materials. I would, I would downplay the role of parametrics from a technical point of view. Uh, certainly parametrics has been a conceptual armature uh, in our thinking long before we even engaged the computer, by the way. We were doing that kind of work with pencil, almost absurdly, I should say. But uh, I do think that somehow the, uh, our insinuations of animations, perspectives, and ways of inhabiting the interstices of, of buildings is a reference to this temporal quality that you ask in your question that can only be described not in the still frame of an analytical object, but rather the absorbed experience of something over, uh, over time and space. And so it, it, is an important, uh, it is an important thing because architectural representations in the strict sense uh, are usually not animate. Uh, and, uh, and the documents that requ are required to build something certainly do not require that animate form. And yet our uh, experience of the world, uh, most often in a state of distraction, uh, uh, is brought to a state of attention at that moment when we recognize we're having an architectural experience. And the, I, mean, I, I, I assume you agree with me that 99% of your day is spent in a state of inattention because you just don't care about the environment until that one moment when something grabs you and you realize that somebody has designed a choreography that could not be accidental, that it was staged somehow. And uh, I'm very much interested in that relationship between scenography, choreography, and architecture. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Nader. So, um couple of last two questions and then, then with that we can wrap it up. Um, so Shashan, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question to Nader. Yeah, uh, hello Nader. Um, I mean, uh, my question is related to, uh, because you're using these materials and weaving and things like this. From the inspiration of the material, uh, to form finding, I, I want you. I want to know what what is the process that works best for you. I mean, for example, if you find a new material that is in, interesting to you, uh, does it affect the form of the uh, whole facades and the things like that? And uh, and then, what is the criteria for finding a new material? Is it is it uh, maybe a sustainability issue, or is it? I mean, there are many issues, obviously. Uh, but what is most important to you in your books? I find it very interesting. I mean, uh, I wish there were a way to exact one's uh, methodologies and to say we always do this and we always do that. The reality is that any project is a chaotic design process. And it involves a range of things. Uh, one of them has to do with a programming process usually undertaken with a client and, and, and dealing with the culture of their institution or the way that they live. Another one has to do with uh, the urban situation within which a, a project um, exists or can transform. And in our case, I would say the material logic that comes from bottom up and informs a technology may come from a culture in the sense that we're borrowing uh, an existing material or we're borrowing a labor consistency within that culture. But then how we do it is usually where we, uh, where we uh, differentiate ourselves from the norm. To that end, uh, what is also important about the way that we work is that we bring, we develop all of these different ways of working concurrently 
And there's a moment somewhere between the end of schematic design and design development where they come into a head-on collision because you have to make priorities. Some of these design requirements are top down because they're zoning restrictions or they have to do with uh, budget constraints that require dumbness and stupidity and others which tolerate uh, invention, transformation or the, the, uh, the introduction of a material that has not been uh, UL approved or something like that. So uh, let me say, just to make the answer more simple, most of the things that we deal with are off the shelf, uh, available in the market, and we're only, uh, uh, we're, we're only undertaking operations on them that require a manipulation of the module and a, a redistribution of them in time and space geometrically in different ways to produce conditions that normative architecture does not. Uh, there are uh, very interesting people like David Benjamin who are dealing with materials research in a much more novel way and in, in a much more radical way, I would say. And we have not been able to uh, undertake some of those kinds of things because that, that also requires a laboratory and a, a, a model of, of work that operates like that. Uh, most of the commissions that you, you saw today do not tolerate that kind of uh, engagement. But, but I would say that the, an important response to you is that our, our process is non-linear. It, it, imagine that you're putting many different determinants in a pool and uh, somehow it's not just the survival of the fittest, it's the survival of critical priorities that share common agendas that end up creating the project as they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nader. So I think with that, uh, we are going to wrap it up because we are running out of, of time. Um, Nader, thank you so, so much. This this was, uh, as usual, beautiful, you know, talk, beautiful work and, you know, very promising uh, book. And, uh, you know, I would love to to get my hands on the draft at some point to maybe give you more systematic feedback. But this was uh, really, really uh, interesting. Um, there are a few things that have been uh, lingering there, but you know, since uh, you are an ally of of IAC, uh, we hope to have you, you know, next year and the followings to keep us uh, up to date on on the latest, uh, you know, um, innovations, ways of working, and projects that you guys are, are doing. So um, again, thank you so much for for joining us today, and and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. So good to be amongst friends. Thank you, another. Bye, ciao. Thank you, Nader. See you soon. Ciao. Thank you, everybody, for attending.